welcome to Halting Toward Zion, a podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson here with Greg Uttinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we are turning our attention today to the ancient empire of Assyria. Uh, we left off last time with Elijah slash Elisha in the history of Israel, um, and right around the corner is the Assyrian Empire. So let's let's put this back in context um, and pick up where we left off last week, and then we'll we'll do a jump back in history. We'll step into our TARDIS <laughs> and figure out where the Assyrians came from. <laughs> uh, my generation was the time tunnel. Uh, <laughs> You, 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 you point out something kind of indirectly that, of course, is very important to our study of history, and that is sequence. Uh, it is not uncommon even for history majors to know these kingdoms and cultures on their own ground and own terms and really not have a clue how they fit into God's story and how they advance his plot. So m anybody who's a history major and was, say, a junior, should at least know that there was this thing called Assyria and that it was important in Mesopotamia and all that. But it, Assyria lasted a long time, and to connect that with the story of God's unfolding covenant may be very difficult for them. They may not, well, mm -hmm. yeah, there was some interaction with Israel, I think, something about one of their kings shutting up the king of Israel and the, uh, the king of Judah in a cage, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to... To add to the Assyrians' short shrift in in a classical school setting, you're really not going to hear much about it because they're not one of the big, you know, they're not Greece, they're not Rome, they're not right. Persia. Why, why Babylon? might that be? Right. They're not even Babylon. Like, <laughs> we've never heard of Assyria. Why, why is that? Well, you know, I have no idea. I think, well, okay, I'm going to be mean. I'm going to be mean and nasty and tell you what I think. I didn't underhand pitch that question to you for you to say you have no idea. <laughs> no, I, well, I hadn't thought about it until I thought about it for like a second and it became rather obvious. Um, because it's not part of the traditional classical Greek Roman education. And because that classical Greek Roman uh, education does not begin with scripture. It throws scripture in later. Mm -hmm. If you're working your way through the Bible, it's impossible to avoid Assyria. You plow right into it in Second Kings, Second Chronicles, Isaiah, Jonah, and a couple other places. But if you're not actually reading the Bible, it's and you just pick up with, well, where all good history books start, Greece, <laughs> then you probably won't know anything about it. Um, so we're going to not to mention not, that classical that. education. I'm going to I'm going to put in the answer that I expected you to give. Okay, good. Go for <laughs> which it. Which was that um, a lot of classical education relies on older educational materials, yes. which might actually predate the study of archaeology. Oh well, there's that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, that was in the back of my mind. It did, just didn't occur to me that's what you were actually going for because <laughs> of what you just said. I was not supplying that some of the older books do go back uh, before archaeology really got off the ground. And there was a time in the late 1800s when the higher critics were saying, Assyria? No, that's a myth. Nineveh never existed. All that stuff? Yeah, the Bible just made that up. There's no... Well, there's a couple references here and there, true in the classical writers, but there's not a scrap of archaeological evidence. So probably there's just this kind of a cultural myth that floated around, stories that went from country to country, and the Bible borrowed them as everyone else did. And there you go. So we don't... We're, we're just And by no archaeological evidence. evidence, we mean um, there's. it's not on our roadmaps, <laughs> because archaeology <laughs> didn't exist yet. <laughs> well, even even when it... Yeah, it, well, that's true. It didn't. It, it didn't. It, it, was, it, it started with Champollion in um, the wake of the Napoleonic Wars, but the first thing that this newfound science of archaeology did was to look at Egypt because all the relics were above ground mm -hmm. and plastered with these hieroglyphic things. And it would be, and then along comes Schliemann and uncovers the ruins of Troy. So now we got Greece in. Syria came, it was probably the next major thing to be pulled into the picture. But uh, Egypt, again, Egypt was above ground, so everyone knew about that. Schliemann, everybody knew um, the Iliad, and so he used that as a roadmap to try to find a likely spot. Assyria, 
Um, there was this young guy named uh, Austin Henry Laird who was, this was the height of the Victorian period where Britain ruled the seas and the world and the sun never set of the British Empire. And he and a friend decided, having nothing better to do in England, they were going to walk to India, to Ceylon, actually, and pick up government posts there because they knew people who knew people. They never made it, and he has, we don't know really what happened to his friend, but they parted company in Mesopotamia because they each had things they wanted to see, old ruins and things. And uh, Laird ended up in the city of Mosul, which was not much of anything at that point. But, but right across the Tigris, there was this big mound that looked really suspicious because it's not a naturally occurring mountain. So what is it and why is it there? And Laird went out and kind of kicked around in it and began to get really suspicious and eventually arranged for some digging to be done. And when, by the time he could get local locals to do the, the labor, they wouldn't go out there at night because they were demons. They began to uncover weird, big things, big statues, um, things with the, with the heads of men, the bodies of, of lions and great wings, cherubim, guardian sphinxes. What they had uncovered was Nineveh. And suddenly everyone had to say, uh oh, <laughs> we, 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 we may need to rewrite our history books just a little bit. <laughs> just add an asterisk, not a fable <laughs> after all. <laughs> yeah, it actually was in Nineveh and it was kind of big and impressive and important. And, and then they looked out over the, uh, the wilderness and saw all these other mounds that were just sitting <laughs> there. And oh no, you mean these are all buried cities and we've been ignoring them for how long? Oh boy, we got a lot of work to do. Uh, I recommend, as uh, as a pre-recommendation recommendation, recommendation uh, The Luck of Nineveh by an author named Brackman who tells uh, Austin Henry Laird's story. And it is a fascinating story. It's a fascinating character. He, he was Indiana Jones before there was an Indiana Jones. <laughs> uh, the adventures he has are crazy. He, he was a spy. He was a school teacher. He was a writer. He was an explorer. He was all kinds of fun things. Anyway, so... Yeah, so we're back to this Assyria thing. If you're reading the Bible, it's right there. And unless you would decide that you don't believe the Bible, you, you got to deal with this thing. It's it's a huge empire. As you say, we left off with Elijah. He's followed by his successor, Elisha. And one of Elisha's tasks was to anoint the next king of Israel, who would not be in the line of Ahab and Jezebel and all that. He'd be an army captain, a young man named Jehu who would rise up and destroy the house of Ahab, destroy Baal worship, and thus the Phoenician element that we were talking about before. Uh, make himself king and, and, and God as a reward for his zeal, not exactly righteous zeal, but zeal nonetheless, um, promised that his sons to the fourth generation would sit successfully on the throne. Uh, and so Israel continues to prosper, and we go through Jehu, Jehoaz, Joash, and we come to Jeroboam II. And at this point, although the prophets are denouncing Israel's sin left and right, it everything looks great. Jeroboam recovers territory, apparently at this point, although Syria has been an issue, it kind of backs off for a while. We'll talk about that in a second. And it's everything's just great. How could, Nothing could possibly go wrong here. Yeah. Meanwhile, in the south, Judah uh, loses, when the house of Ahab goes down, uh, the queen mother, Athaliah, who's the daughter of Jezebel, sees her opportunity, goes into the, into the uh, palace nursery and kills all the royal children, except one young boy named Joash, who is rescued by the high priest and his daughter. And when and eventually he comes to the throne through a conspiracy of light, and we again tick off Kings that are fairly familiar, if you've read the Book of Kings and studied it a bit, or Chronicles. And we come very quickly in, in that line to a very wicked king named Ahaz. And now we have Israel in the north. It's peaked It's peaked its power under the, the rule of Jeroboam II, and then begins to spin down. And while all this is happening, here comes on the horizon this great, powerful bear of an empire called Assyria. If we look back further to Genesis, which is where everything begins, we find in the, in the table of nations that Assyria, as a people, were descended from Sham. They're, they're Semitic. 
But we also see that shortly after Babel, uh, our tyrant uh, Nimrod goes up into Assyria and founds the city called Nineveh. The original capital of the country was called Asher. The people were called Asher. The capital was called Asher. Their ancestor is Asher, and their chief god is their ancestor deified called Asher. Asher. <laughs> a lot of Ashers going around. It's the Greeks who couldn't pronounce or write and ended up calling it Assyria, as they <laughs> screwed up everybody else's names. So there, there had been an Assyrian presence there for a long time. It's connected with Nimrod and Babel and all of that. It shares its Mesopotamian. It shares the same sort of dream of one world order. We'll talk more about their particular spin on it later. But they, they come and go in the background. Um, and during the time of uh, the judges and David and Solomon, they are minor players to the north. And we don't see much of them. We don't worry about them. But now they're making a big comeback. And if you've read the Bible at all, if you've read the Old Testament, names like uh, Tiglath-Pileser and uh, Sennacherib might be familiar names uh, because now Assyria is expanding. First of all, though, before it, it started, it's getting scary. And God calls this guy named Jonah <laughs> to go preach to them and tell them, that God is displeased and that it's all over for them. 40 days in their capital, then it will be destroyed. And most of us know the story. Jonah doesn't want to go because he's afraid that God's going to be gracious. He jumps on a ship for Tarshish, the end of the world, and God raises up a storm and the mariners are forced to throw him overboard to get rid of him. And this great fish swallows him. And eventually, upon his repentance, spits him up on dry ground. And he goes back to Nineveh and finally grudgingly preaches and the whole city repents, and Jonah is not happy, and that's where the book ends. <laughs> but it did apparently stop the Assyrian war machine for a generation. They stopped spreading and pushing and conquering, and for a generation, and, and Jesus himself bears witness to it, the men of Nineveh, Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. Behold, one greater than Jonah is here. So it was a real revival, one of the greatest in the history of the world, because all they had was 40 days and Nineveh was destroyed. Um, so that's during the days of Jeroboam II in in the northern kingdom of Israel. But the the people of Nineveh apparently were unable uh, or incompetent enough to transmit their faith to the next generation. And in the next generation or so, Assyria renews its conquest and begins spreading out. And so by the time we get to the middle of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles, Assyria is now the great danger. And, and, and until the coming of Babylon, it occupies the hearts of those two historical books and makes a lot of uh, noise in Isaiah's prophecy as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Assyria is interesting to think about because it shows us the pattern that we see in Old Testament history, that God raises up these empires, these pagan nations to either save them as often a condemnation of Israel or Judah's mm -hmm, unbelief mm -hmm. and to call them to repentance and say, the Gentiles are turning. You should, I'm treating them well. I'm blessing them. I'm going to make you jealous. Um, <laughs> or it's to use them as uh, an arm of judgment. And it's interesting. It shows those two sides of judgment, either punishment or a call to repentance that mm. brings life. And so there's these little snippets of how, uh, we think of uh, Romans 11, how yes. mm -hmm. he calls the Gentiles so that Israel would be jealous in a sense and say, hey, wait a minute, we were the first. Um, but it, he does this with every single one of these empires where you have rulers and the people in general hear the word of God and actually repent. And God's people, like in the time of Jeroboam II, are not listening to him at all. And they're trusting in their own wealth and power. Um, and yet we see somebody far more powerful like Assyria turned to the Lord in complete humility and submission. The same thing with Babylon, Media Persia, maybe not so much with Greece, but the ones that we see in the Bible particularly pictured are showing us God's pattern in history. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. so so clearly imaged in Jonah. You know, mm -hmm. the, you mentioned how it ends with Jonah just being grumpy, <laughs> grumpy <laughs> even to death. Yes. Um, <laughs> and we don't know how Jonah's personal story ended, just as we don't know how the older brother of the prodigal son ended up. 
Mm, yes. God's scheme of giving grace to show that he will give grace. And I appreciate you trying tying this in with judgment, because often when we speak of judgment, all people see is negativity and an mm -hmm. angry God, and where's the love and grace of God, and it's not the last day yet, so God doesn't really judge. Well, that's to completely misunderstand judgment. Yeah. Um, judgment, God's judgment within history, there is a God that judgeth in the earth, we're told more than once. Uh, it serves a number of purposes. One, it's to stop really bad people from being really bad people because mm -hmm. they're hurting other people who aren't quite as bad. Uh, sometimes they're persecuting the church. They need to be stopped. That's love to God's church and, and to just poor people who are oppressed. God actually doesn't want uh, wicked governments and, and kings and emperors oppressing even their own people. That's not mm -hmm. what God wants. That's not. It would not be loving for God to let that just go on and on and on. And that's what he tells us when he institutes the death penalty, the yeah. very mm -hmm. beginning of, <laughs> of the yeah. new world after the flood. It's not good that wickedness should be unbridled. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But then on top of that, there is the, the fear the Lord factor. Mm -hmm. God brought judgment. He spared you. At least you're not dead. If you're here hearing the message, you're not dead yet. This, is, this judgment has bought you time and the ability to face yourself and think, doing not that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. And so, yeah, if God just lets you go on, not only you go on hurting people, but you go on thinking, and I'll, uh, God doesn't hear, God doesn't see, I can get away with this forever. And that also would not be loving of God. Mm -hmm. He needs to draw lines in the sand so that people realize, uh-oh, uh, there is a God and I'm in a lot of trouble. That doesn't mean they always listen, but at least God shakes his spear to get their attention. Uh, and of course, if they don't, then that's more wrath on them in the end. But judgment is not a bad thing. Ju judgment is God saying, hey, come over here. Let me look mm -hmm. at you. Let's talk. Um, and you, some bad things may happen to you. But if you survive, repentance is always a possibility. God is gracious. God will always receive those who turn to him in, in fear and in faith. Uh, and so Syria does up well, front. And of course, you can't leave out the final option of judgment, yeah. that you come before God and he judges you righteous, <laughs> which is the goal yeah. of all this. <laughs> for who judges you righteous for Jesus' sake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that so you can God, actually have fellowship with him and enjoy You can have fellowship <laughs> with him. Yeah. So all of that is weaving through all of this. Uh, so let's, let's and, and Rachel, I know you did... Um, some research. Well, you did some research. Let's pull that in right now while I'm thinking of it. Uh, Assyria, I said, becomes part of this age-old dream of this new world order. We're going to have a one world government. We're going to be the unity. Um, you, you're telling us about um, the seal or flag or something of Assyria? The, yeah, I was looking up just out of curiosity, what is the symbol of Assyria? Um, it was interesting to find it in a modern organization called the Assyrian Cultural Foundation yeah. um, that tells people to display this flag as part of their cultural heritage, particularly those that still look back and call themselves Assyrian um, by being old churches from that area. So oh. it was it was a weird combination. You have the Chaldean church and the Assyrian church that are still variations on Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic in the uh -huh. Middle East. Um, so that was kind of a weird combination, but it gave me an explanation of their flag, um, which begins in the center with a sun. Of course, the sun being in their imagery, the source of light and life and all things the energy of the universe. Uh, and then it has four compass points going out uh, to symbolize, in a sense, the spread of their land, which they considered themselves to basically rule all the land mm -hmm. that there was in the four directions of the world. Um, so those basically make a cross. And then between those four points going out in four directions are these three rivers, which there were three rivers in their area, uh, the Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Great Zab. And so you could see it looks like all the rivers are flowing towards the center, towards them. So they control the land 
pointing in all directions and everything flows into them in that sense of we are the center, we are the source, we are the sun that everything orbits around. Um, they will not be the first or the last to pick up this imagery. We could think of a modern, more modern example with someone like Louis the Fourteenth, who was mm. called the Sun King, the sun King. Mm -hmm. where he literally believed that everything should orbit around him. And so he made his <laughs> palace filled with all sorts of uh, celestial references of the gods of the different planets and things like that. Um, but it's that idea that every, the source of life, all aspects of the world should be or they claim to be under their dominion and rule and with one single center, of course, uh, that everything is supposed to point to, look to, and find their source in, um, which is the same world order religion that we have coming all the way from Babel forward. Um, but you see it symbolized literally in that flag. They do also add to their flag the symbol of Asher, their god which if you look at that, it changes over time. But it reminds me a little bit of those cherubim guardians mm -hmm. mixed with um, a bow and arrow because he's sometimes called the god of war. Uh, sometimes it has a sun flaming around him. Uh, normally he has some form of wings or and sometimes there's a snake uh, because they do also positively called themselves the great dragon, mm. um, the great serpent. <laughs> uh, so it's another way of showing that um, over them in some form, helping them is this God, though they never really consider him a singular God. He's still one of many, um, but it's their preferred ancestor. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing the ancestor worship, the worship of the dead again, Syria, um, lies on the northern side of the Tigris uh, River, but this is still more or less Mesopotamia. It's not exactly in the middle. It's still slightly to one side, but it's that same region. Um, Asher was the original capital. Um, eventually Nineveh becomes the capital. And uh, when Jonah's preaching is done, the Assyrians in a generation or two are out, again, conducting war. The Old Testament, the Book of Kings and the Book of Chronicles, at this point, draw our attention to it. Uh, well, first of all, uh, there's we've talked about Jonah. We know his story pretty well, I would think. But then in the south, the southern kingdom, a man named Ahaz comes to the throne. His father and grandfather had been pretty godly kings, had done most things well. He's a complete rat. Uh, he does not love God. In fact, he hates God and shows contempt for God. And Isaiah is prophesying at this point. And it's at this point that the northern kingdom of Israel and the kingdom north of them, that we, we call Syria, they call themselves Aram, as in Aramaic. Um, the, these two kingdoms, Syria and, and Israel, had been fighting for a long time. And a good the first part of the book of of uh, Second Kings, that's largely what we're we're dealing with. We're dealing with the wars back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then suddenly they stop and they uh, they uh, you know drop their battle axes and shake hands and say, uh, "There's something bigger and badder coming over the horizon. If we work together, maybe we can stand up to it." Oh, let's send messengers down to Egypt. Yeah, they'll they'll be with us. And then there's Judah. Hey, Ahaz. Want to be part of a coalition that opposes the coming of this great nation of Assyria? And Ahaz says, "No, I don't like you guys. I don't want to play with you. <laughs> no, no, really. This is we need you. We can't have. We're not going to fight Assyria to the north and have you at, the, at our backs being a sissy. So you know, get with it. No, no, um, no. I no. You go do. You go. You go play. I'll. Um, I have my own game plan." And it's at this point that um, some of the history in the book of Isaiah begins, and it's echoed in Chronicles and in Kings. Uh, God sends Isaiah to, uh, to Ahaz, and Ahaz and his, his people are getting a little worried because the word on the street is that Syria and Israel, not having been able to come to terms with Ahaz, are going to turn on him, join forces, take Jerusalem, put a puppet king on the throne, and turn around and be ready for when Assyria comes. And Isaiah comes and says, don't worry about this. Got you covered. Israel's my people, although you have to trust me. So ask a sign of the Lord your God. Ask it either in the heavens above or in the deep beneath. And Ahaz looks at Isaiah and says, 
I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord my God. <laughs> and Isaiah says, O house of David, is it a small thing that you should weary men, and will you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. And so begins Isaiah's famous Christmas sermon. And there are little pieces here and there that we know all about. Light shining in Galilee, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, a root of the house of David, the lamb lying down with the lion, the world being full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the seas from chapter 7 through chapter 12. One of the more famous sections of Isaiah that we, we read verses from every year. But what most people don't know, I suspect, is the context is... Okay, Ahaz, you think you're all that because you're the house of David and God has made commitments and promises and you can use God and, and ignore him and treat him any way you want. And he's bound by his promise always to be there and pick up the, your dirty work afterwards. Uh, no, it does not work that way. Uh, we don't, we, God and his prophets don't need you. We don't need the house of David as you're fancying it. Because you know what? We can, God can bring forth Messiah from a virgin. And people wonder about that. What? What's that got to do with anything? Well, it's got this to do with it. The house, God is not going to need the kings of the house of David. He will use them. But it turns out in the long run that Messiah is not born from their genes, from their blood. He comes through another son of David, a man named Nathan. And Mary is a blood descendant of Nathan not a blood descendant of the kings of Israel. So the kings of Israel are free to go to the chopping block at this point. He will eventually use the title that passes to the kingly line, but he will not use a drop of their blood. And that's largely what this Christmas sermon is about. God, God, God is not thwarted by Assyrian might or his people's unbelief. He's going to bring forth Messiah in his time. And though he come as a child, he will be God with us. Uh, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Well, Ahaz does not buy into this at all. He kind of grunts and groans and sends messengers to the king of Assyria and says, hey, I want to be your friend. I am your son. I am your tributee. Here's, here's money. Go attack those other nations, please. And the king of Assyria says, oh, okay. And, um, this is sort of background material, sort of not. Uh, we run into Tiglath-Pileser III. The Bible calls him Tiglath-Pileser, Tiglath-Pileser, Pol. There's a bunch of names. Uh, but he listens to Hezekiah, probably already had this on his agenda anyway. But he comes against Syria, destroys it, carries his people captive, moves on to Israel. Uh, does not finish the job, but he begins the deportation of northern Israel into Assyria, and that's a job that the later kings will finish. Now, here I think is a good point to say something about Assyria's version of the New World Order. Mm -hmm. As we continue our study in history, we're going to go to Babylon, and Medo-Persian, Greece, and Rome. These are all variations on a theme, and as I mentioned before the, the broadcast started, um, later on, one of the histories will look at the kings of Persia and call them the kings of Assyria. And it's easy for, for skeptics to say, they can't even get their own history right. No, God knows exactly what he's doing. This is the same empire. It just keeps morphing a little bit. And they each have their own flavor. Assyria's flavor was remarkably brutal and honest. You will serve us and you will do what we say, or we will wipe you off the face of the earth and we'll scare you to death along the way. There you go. Any, anybody want to stand up to us now? Um, it's kind of an they, interesting inversion of God's pattern, where mm -hmm. the the empire that conquers in the worldly sense simply becomes another form of what it supposedly conquered. Yeah. Whereas with God's kingdom, the the light overcomes the darkness, and we we conquer our enemies by making them our friends, and we're still winning. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's, it's the yeah. opposite. Yeah, Assyria's idea was first of all. Um, Act really, I mean, t talk about terror. Let's act really terrible. When we defeat people, let's behead the corpses. Um, let's 
oh, skin them alive or skin them dead, as the case may be, and take the, those human skins to the next city we plan to attack and nail this human skins to their gates with the me implied message being surrender or this happens to you. Oddly enough, a lot of people surrendered. <laughs> um, but once they conquered these lands, they often, in order to prevent revolution, in order to keep people from falling back on local national loyalties or simply loyalty to the land they were on, would take these people and would scatter them to the four corners of the earth. And thus, effectively, it becomes genocide. Not in the sense that, that they try to kill everybody of any given particular uh, genetic stripe, but that they spread them out and mix them so thoroughly on, on such an international scale that eventually you, you say you're an Israelite and you go into captivity. Well, the guy on one side is a Philistine, the guy on the other is Syrian, the guy across the way is from Egypt, the guy around the block is from Babylon. You don't even speak the same language. You don't have the same gods. What do you have? That you're all citizens of the Assyrian Empire. Mm -hmm. um, you Assyrians? don't even have the same religious holidays to have a no. barbecue <laughs> Right. Yeah, there's nothing going on here. Uh, that was their goal, a, a new homogeneity that will simply be Assyrian and nothing else. Well, as I say, it was honest, it was straightforward, it was bold, and it was frightening. And it, it did have this one thing. Nobody liked them. <laughs> You know, we, we, we get later with, say, um, Persia, and a lot of people didn't really mind too much belonging to the Persian Empire because they pretty much left you alone to do your own thing under your own people without interfering a whole lot, as long as you pay taxes and contribute soldiers to the army. Uh, but here, these are nasty people who do nasty things in very nasty ways. And, and so when Assyria finally falls, it's not to, to one nation it just accidentally runs into. It's to a whole bunch of nations that have been warring against her for a long time. And there simply comes the point where they all say, what if we all took them on together? And they do. And Assyria by that time has so been so weakened and demoralized uh, and effeminized, if that's a word, um, that they can't- Emasculated. Emasculated, thank you. That <laughs> They can't, one, one of the last pictures, now it comes from the Greek, so it's not wholly fair, but one of the <laughs> yeah. last, one of the last Greek pictures of, of Assyrian culture is showing the last king uh, living on his couch, eating dainties and dressed like a woman in woman's makeup. That was their idea of how far the Assyrians had sunk. I assume the Greeks considered dressing like a woman as an insult. With the Greeks, you're never sure. Um, <laughs> Depends on the Greek, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Anyhow, so this is what's going on. Ahaz is appealing to Assyria and Assyria agrees and, and makes Israel their little pet, except being a pet to a tyrant turns out not to be so hot after all. Um, in, uh, in Kings, we find that Ahaz uh, actually goes to visit uh, Tiglath Pileser yeah, when he takes Damascus and there sees an altar and says, oh, what a cool altar. My altar is not nearly so cool and sends word back to the high priest, make me an altar like this. Uh, and when he comes back, the altar's made, and he takes God's altar and makes it his private altar and puts this new altar in its place, and then constructs um, uh, a pathway, uh, that's not the word, I don't know what you would call it, from his own palace out into Jehovah's temple complex, particularly for the king of Assyria, should he ever come. don't think he ever did. Uh, but he, Ahaz is moving everything in terms of his total allegiance, total commitment to this pagan, his gods, and his world view. And, and things are, are, are looking really bad, and um, Ahaz dies. And his son comes to the throne. His son is named Hezekiah. Hmm. Somehow, Ahaz was so busy doing his political shenanigans, he forgot to um, corrupt his son enough. <laughs> Uh, his son may have hung Small out with, uh, yes, <laughs> his uh, son may have been hanging out with uh, Grandfather Jotham or something. But anyway, somehow he is a man of faith. And if we were continuing with Israel's history, we talk about the great revival he led and the transformations of Israeli culture. But for our purposes, Hezekiah says in so many words, we're done with this Assyria thing. We're not going to kiss up to them. We're not going to follow in their paths. In fact, we're not going to pay tribute. 
And by now there's a new king on the throne of Assyria. His name is uh, Sennacherib. If you know British literature, you may know the poem <laughs> uh, The Destruction of Sennacherib by Lord mm-hmm. Byron. The Assyrian came, poem. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. The sheen of his spear was like stars on the sea when the blue waves roll nightly on deep galley. It goes on to tell how, which is which is what the Bible tells us, that the uh, Assyrians come, the Assyrian army um, delegated by Sennacherib comes, already to trounce Jerusalem, and then God intervenes, and it's not a pretty picture. Uh, by the time they're done, the angel of the Lord, Jesus, intervenes. And Byron's closing lines are, The widows of Asher are loud in their wail. The idols are broke in the temple of Baal. For the might of the Gentile, and smote by the sword, has melted like snow in the glance of the Lord. Well, what happens is that Sennacherib doesn't appreciate that Hezekiah isn't paying tribute. And although he's busy, he's not busy enough. He's not so busy, he can't deal with that. <laughs> and he sends armed forces to confront Hezekiah. Hezekiah sends out his spokesman to meet Sennacherib's spokesman. And the Kings, Chronicles, and Isaiah both describe what happens there. There's a lot of uh, political game playing, and one's up, one ups and ship as Sennacherib's representative, uh, the Rab Shaka, um, it's a court title tries to make fun of Hezekiah and Israel, Jude at this point, and everything else, um, and says, and uh, don't trust your God because your God's the one who sent me to destroy you. And unfortunately, that seemed more than possible at that point, because <laughs> mm-hmm. it sure could have been. Uh, it's interesting but, to note, if I can break in your narrative sure, really quick. Sure. Um, so my husband, David, did a sermon on Isaiah 7 for Christmas mm. time. Mm-hmm. And he actually connected the two um, Ahaz and Rabshaka stories because they mm. actually happen at the same pool yes. In, yes. Um, in Jerusalem. And so the first place where Isaiah promises a sign to show that God can deliver by his own means and then Ahaz turns to Assyria is then where Assyria comes and threatens. And now Hezekiah is going to have to go back and trust in the promise that Isaiah gave. So it's Mm -hmm. an interesting um, interplay between those two periods that I had not noticed before he pointed it out. So I thought I would throw it in there. Yeah, that's, Mm -hmm. that's yes. Um, And it's interesting what place it is. Mm -hmm. It's the upward pool uh, by the Fuller's field. In other words, Mm -hmm. It's the place that gives Jerusalem her water, and it's a place where you can make things white as snow. Mm-hmm. And that's where the promise of the gospel is given. There are no coincidences here. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Rabshakeh is, uh, threatens um, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah turns to God, and God says, don't worry about it. Got it covered. And the Rabshakeh receives word from his master uh, that amounts to get back here. We have a problem. The Egyptians are coming. But before he goes very far, the Reb Shaka sends back word to Hezekiah and says, "Yeah, no, you're not getting out of this. Don't think you're you're going to be rescued. Uh, where are all of the other nations? Where are the gods of the other nations? Did the gods of this city or that city or this city? How about the gods of Samaria? Did they rescue them? Who is your god that he should be able to rescue you from my hand?" And that's where you go, ah, oh, you went too far. <laughs> you yes. just, just crossed a line. I'm so glad line. you asked. <laughs> <laughs> and Hezekiah takes the letter to the temple and spreads it out before God and points and says, look at this. And meanwhile, he sends um, messengers to Isaiah and says, this is what's going on. And Hezekiah, by divine inspiration, replies, don't even worry. Here's the message you send back. The virgin daughter of Zion laughs you to scorn. She sticks out her tongue at you. That says the Lord, I, in modern English, I know where you live. <laughs> this is, and to Hezekiah, it's don't even where you're going to, the, the rim that will escape will put down roots, bear fruit, got you covered. And that night, the angel of the Lord goes out and kills, I forget the number, 100,000 plus of the Assyrian troops, just about the time the Egyptian troops are showing up. And so uh, Sennacherib leaves rather quickly. (laughs) 
and goes home. And sometime after, it's not an immediate thing, but before too long, his sons decide they don't like their daddy. And while he's worshiping in the house of his God, they kill him and they run off to the northern kingdom of Yoratu. Well, we don't hear much about Yoratu, but if you listen to the consonants, Rat, we call it Ararat. Mm. And so does the King James Version of the Bible. It was a major kingdom. And it was one of the things that Assyria had to keep watching because every turn the time they turned their back, it attacked them more or less <laughs> successfully. So that's where the sun, apparently they had been bought off by the king of Eratu. So they flee up there. And so Sennacherib dies. His son, Ezra Haddon, comes to the throne. He takes on, now Assyria doesn't go away. And it might be easy to assume by reading scripture because Jerusalem isn't immediately threatened that it, it just evaporates. No, it's still there. As our Haddon takes Egypt, um, there is something else, though, that's going on here in the background. I almost forgot. That's really important to the story. Uh, about the time that Sennacherib is coming, Hezekiah, having led a great revival and done great things for God, as he perceives it, falls sick. Mm -hmm. And he calls for Isaiah. And Isaiah says, God says you're dying. Get your house in order. It's, it's time. You're done. And Hezekiah can't handle that and turns to God and weeps on his bed. And we have his prayer in, in Chronicles. Uh, I've done all these things for you. And if I go down to the grave, I can't praise you. Some of it sounds a bit like the Psalms, but there's none of this, but not my will, but yours. Um, and so before Isaiah has even got out of the palace, God says, go back, tell him, oh, okay, I hear you. Can I add you 15 more years to your life? So Isaiah goes, it's fine. God heard you. And Hezekiah says, and what's the sign that I'll, that I'll recover and go up to the house of the Lord of worship? <laughs> you want uh, a sign? Sure. What sure. <laughs> signs. God does signs all the time. Um, oh, look out there. There's a sundial your, your dad created. Um, you want the shadow to go forward of 10 degrees or backwards 10 degrees? Oh, it's not. It goes forward all the time. That's just time passing. Let's see it go <laughs> backward. Okay, fine. And so the, the, the shadow and the sundial, and therefore presumably the sun, move backward. Cool. Hezekiah's going to live. For 15 more years, during that time, he begets a son named Manasseh, who's the worst king Israel, Judah, mm -hmm. ever has, who nearly brings, in fact, he does bring Judah to destruction. He went, by the time he's done, God says, we're done. There's mm -hmm. nothing that's going to fix this. It's just a matter of time now. So be careful what you pray for. <laughs> Um, but in Chronicles, we're told that the king of Babylon, at this point, Babylon was not a huge empire. It was one city within the Assyrian empire that kept rebelling against Assyria, to go figure that one, under the leadership of a man named, depending on, on how you read it, uh, Merodach Baladin. Uh, and uh, this, this is a guy who's... he's. Well, got to be aware of ethnic slurs here. There are countries that are constantly throwing revolutions and, and leaders that go into exile and come back and lead revolutions again. Yeah, he's one of those guys. Um, I, I think three times he leads Babylon into rebellion. And finally, they just say enough is enough. And they destroy Babylon completely. And then Ezra Haddon rebuilds it, the idiot. But moving back, Merodach Baladin... Uh, hanging out with the Babylonians, uh, gets word, hey, sire, uh, we just saw something kind of weird. What well, was that? The sun just moved in the sky. What? Well, it does that all the time. Yeah, move backward. It did what? Yeah, find out why that happened, please. You're astronomers, right? Or astrologers? Yes, sir. And eventually, well, we, 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 you remember that thing about the sun? There's this king over in this little place called Judah, <laughs> and apparently his God moved the sun for him to show he was going to get well. Aha. Uh -huh. okay. Where do I get me a God who can do that? <laughs> yeah, or at least an alliance with the God, with the guy who works for him. Get some ambassadors. I want to send a present and a message. <laughs> and so these messengers show up and inquire after Hezekiah's health. Hmm. Yeah. And Hezekiah, How are you? <laughs> Hezekiah is so flattered that he shows the ambassadors everything he has. Oh, of all of his strength. Of course he does. Um, when uh, Premier Khrushchev of the Soviet Union came to visit the United <laughs> States, my uh, first pastor was doing a little radio program in, in Oregon at the time. He used that as his material for the, yeah, these ambassadors come from a far place and you show them everything. You know what's going to happen next? 
<laughs> and this is what, at least this is what happened with Babylon. Um, Isaiah shows up a little late and says, wait, who are these guys? Where do they come from? Oh, they're from some little city, someplace, someplace called Babylon. And by the way, Babylon and Babel are the same word in Hebrew. They come from Babel. Hezekiah should have known what Babel was. <laughs> what have you shown them? Oh, there is nothing I didn't show them. Everything I have, I showed them. Uh-huh. Fabulous. Yeah, it was great. Hear the word of the Lord. Everything that you have and all of your children and everything that you're going to lay up, they're all going to go to this Babylon. Oh. Well, at least there will be peace and truth in my time. Thanks, Neville Chamberlain. <laughs> I was like, that's definitely Hezekiah's low point. <laughs> yeah, God, the text says that God left him to see what was in his heart. Something we can all pray that God does not do to us. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Hezekiah in, in time goes to be with his Lord and his son Manasseh comes to the throne and Manasseh is the wickedest king uh, Judah's ever had. He institutes more idolatry, Baal worship, child sacrifice, astrology, persecutes God's prophets, until finally the Assyrians come and they are tired of his shenanigans. He's probably bothered them too. And they throw him into a prison in Babylon, of all places. <laughs> um, and in prison, he faces God and repents and God is merciful and restores him to the throne. but And he tries to fix things, but he's an old man. His time is short, and he can't do a whole lot. And then that brings us, he has a son named Ammon, who was as bad as he was at his bad point, but his reign is short. And then the next man on the throne of Judah is Josiah. Meanwhile, Israel's gone into captivity. Um, the, the 10 tribes to the north, they've been scattered. There's nothing left there. So Josiah comes to the throne when uh, Assyria is beginning to feel some heat from other directions. And so he kind of has a free hand to roam up and down what had once been both Judah and Israel and get rid of idols and destroy all the superstitious and pagan elements that have permeated the land. And he does it. He, he leads a great revival and, and God uses him mightily. Meanwhile, Assyria... Assyria has undergone extreme moral decline. They, they, they've lost focus. They've lost their vision for conquering, and they're just living it up on luxury. And so all of the major conquered nations around them, or the not-so-conquered nations, the nations they should have conquered are the ones that slipped with their fingers, all kind of get together. And again, one of them is Babylon. And they say, in so many words, let's get them. And all of these nations attack Nineveh, and they take Nineveh. And the royal family and the army flees to a city called Carchemish on the Euphrates River. Flashback to scripture. The Egyptians are a puppet state of Assyria at this point. And the king of Egypt is a man named Pharaoh Necho. And he says, hmm, it would be great to get up there and help my master and maybe rescue him. That would make me really cool and get lots of favors. Or, you know, I could always maybe pick up the pieces if can't rescue him, and I could be the next big cheese on the block. So he sets out, and his path takes him right through Judah. God is fine with this. Josiah is not. Josiah does not want to get wholly enmeshed in the geopolitical situation. He's not committing the armies of Judah. He's not sending troops. He's staying out of it, but he does realize sort of, you know, if I stick out my finger right now and Necho trips, if he gets, if I can slow him down, I don't have to go fight at Karkovish. I can just deprive the Assyrians of some key help, and that would that would be a good thing. And so as he gets ready to fight, Necho sends him a message that says, I had a word from your God last night. He told me not to mess with you. Um, so I'm going straight through. I'm not attacking you. I'm not invading. I'm going up to Euphrates. I got a battle there. Stay out of my face, or you'll have to answer to your God. And Josiah... Again, low point, thinks, well, he says that, but I mean, I'm me. Wouldn't, wouldn't Jeremiah or someone like that come and tell me? Why would I get a word of God from a complete Gentile pagan? Because God never uses them. But if I go into battle, he'll try to avoid it because he doesn't want to answer to God, what he thinks is God, what he says is God. So 
I know I'll disguise myself in my army and we'll go attack as a bunch of marauders and then he, he'll fight us and we can engage in war can happen. The battlefield is a place called Megiddo. Mm. The book of Revelation calls it Armageddon. Um, he goes, he fights, he's wounded, he dies. And this battle begins Judah's spin down into destruction. Neko reaches Carchemish as unable to help and then runs back as fast as he can with his army, being pursued by the clear winner at Carchemish, a Babylonian general named Nebuchadnezzar. And that's the end of the Assyrian Empire. As the Assyrian Empire, Babylon's going to pick up the pieces, <laughs> yep. as we said earlier, and continue the dream. They're just going to play the game a little nicer. And we will be talking shortly about uh, how Babylon plays the game, particularly as we see it through the eyes of Daniel and his companions. Yeah. That's great. We went a little bit over time, but for a thousand years of history and an yeah. entire <laughs> course of an empire, I think we did pretty good. Yeah. So let's yeah. wrap up with some recommendations. Rachel, what do you got? First. Oh, oh, yeah. Emily, you go first. Okay. Well, I have one that's a musical group mm. called They Might Be Giants. <laughs> uh, what brought them to mind is a song they have called the Mesopotamians, which deceptively is not, you know, about anything historical. It's just, they, they, it's a song about this band called the Mesopotamians and they drive around town in their van and no one's ever heard of them. Um, <laughs> but they name four Mesopotamian kings, one of whom is Ashurbanipal, who was ah. an Assyrian king. So that's why I thought of them. They do have some great educational materials <laughs> um, <laughs> specifically marketed uh, at children, but they're very well written. They're catchy. They're interesting. Uh, very fun music. You might know um, Istanbul, not Constantinople. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's, that's them. Uh, uh, they also did uh, Why Does the Sun Shine? The sun is mm -hmm. a massive incandescent gas, a gigantic nuclear furnace. Uh, another very well-known <laughs> catchy song. At least they it might be mean, giants. means something. Do you know <laughs> where the phrase they might be giants comes from? I do not. It comes from a movie starring um, George C. Scott and I forget who the female lead is. Uh, Scott is delusional. He thinks he's Sherlock Holmes. The female lead is a doctor named Watson, who's a psychiatrist. <laughs> hmm. And um, they have a conversation about reality. And they talk about Don Quixote. Hmm. And uh, Scott's character, the would-be Sherlock Holmes, says the problem was not, he did not say, if he had said they are giants, the windmills, that would be insanity. Hmm. When he says they might be giants. Oh, He's right. That, that's, that's a wholly different perspective. Anyway. Mm. Just Interesting. <laughs> Rachel? All right. Well, I'm going to uh, recommend something different. Uh, I'm going to recommend trying a new ethnic kind of food. Mm. Because in uh, marrying my husband, David, he I have found lots of different cuisines that he likes that I've never tried and vice versa. Uh, so one of my favorites has been Ethiopian food. Mm. And if you live in the Sacramento area, there is a wonderful, authentic Ethiopian restaurant called Queen of Sheba down. Ooh. I want to say it's on Broadway. Uh -huh. Somewhere near there. Um, but it is fun to get to try out all the different spices or even make it at home and see how you use the same spices, but put them in different combinations. So I've had a lot of fun trying out um, or trying to make things for David in the cuisines that he most enjoys and um, often being able to use the same ingredients I normally have. So there's my little plug for try something new. You <laughs> might be surprised. Nice. I already mentioned the luck of Nineveh, but I'm going to recommend something else that's more serious. It's this whole business of teaching history. A lot of Christians are have been pulled into something called classical Christian education. Depending on how you define that, that can be kind of okay, or it can be really a trap. Here's my recommendation. If you are teaching Christian education and you're teaching history, you start with the Bible. You do not start with the Greeks and Romans. You do not start with Herodotus. You do not start with Egyptian archaeology. You start with the Bible and let it define the categories for you and let it, it trace your history. Once you get to the point where we actually do have written records, fine, introduce those written records. Let the Bible judge their accuracy and proceed. But in the beginning of our conversation, said, well, people don't know about Assyria. Well, 
they should if they're Christians, because it's in the Bible all over the place. So if you have listened today and found that you really don't know much about Assyria, read your Bibles and you will. Just begin in the beginning, proceed to the ending, and then do it again. <laughs> There's my recommendation. That's a wonderful recommendation. Right. Well, thank you both so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure as always. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Uh, thanks also to our transcriptionist who donates the transcripts for Halting Toward Zion. If you'd like to receive those transcripts in your email inbox, you can subscribe to our Substack. Uh, send them to a friend who might be interested. Uh, big thank you also to our financial supporters supporting us on Patreon. Um, I think we are still on the anchor support thing. We kind of tried to shift towards Patreon because um, anchor was making matters difficult for some of our supporters and we didn't appreciate that. Um, but however you would like to support us either by money or by prayers or by sharing or just by listening. Uh, thank you so much. We appreciate it. And we hope you'll tune in again next time. 